uh, subject for, for all of us. Uh, and I'm going to introduce Larry Makovich, who will lead a panel discussion on the global role of nuclear energy in addressing the threat of climate change. Uh, Larry is a Vice President Senior Advisor at IHS Energy Insights. He is a real expert in the electric power industry and directs IHS Cambridge Energy Research Associates research efforts into the power sector. Uh, he has recently advised uh, really several large utilities and major strategic engagements. He's testified numerous times before the US Congress on electric power policy and advised governments like China and Brazil on power issues. Uh, joining Larry this morning is going to be a really good panel. Jay Fison, who is the founder and CEO of the ClearPath Foundation. And Jay is, uh, was gracious enough to jump into this panel. Uh, Jason Grumet, who chairs the, uh, is the president of the Bipartisan Policy Center, uh, had a, uh, a, a personal uh, uh, incident that he had to take care of. So he had a dropout yesterday. We'll miss Jason. He's really a great guy. He would have been a good addition here. But Jay was kind enough to do this. Uh, Christy Todd Whitman, who co-chairs the Safe and Clean Energy, uh, the Clean and Safe Energy Coalition, is the former uh, New Jersey governor and EPA administrator and has been just a voice of reason out there for almost a decade for us right now, and we just appreciate her leadership. And then Doug Vine, who's a senior energy fellow at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, which is a very prominent uh, think tank in Washington, D.C. that has a lot to say on climate change, led by the former deputy administrator at the Environmental Protection Agency. So please join me in welcoming the panel to the stage. Okay, well, thank you very much, Marv, for the invitation to um, take a few minutes here to set this panel up um, with some uh, linear data-driven uh, assessments of what we've got ahead on the climate issue. Uh, so what I've done is I've put together six points, and I think the best way to, uh, to kind of get these points across would be with a couple of pictures. So I've got three pictures here uh, that I want to share with you. Uh, to try to define for you the scope of the challenge that we have, and then we can turn to our panel here uh, to give us some assessments on what they think the problem looks like and the solution pathways and how does nuclear fit into that. So let me start with uh, the first uh, graphic here. Um, as you probably know, CO2 in the atmosphere is necessary for life. There's a huge cycle of CO2 going up sources and then sinks of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the problem, as climate scientists tell us, is that our human activity has added some sources here, tipped things out of balance, and so we've got this accumulating concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere from the pre-industrial level when we weren't having an influence on the CO2 level. So pre-industrial, you had about 180 to 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, in the past 25 years, we've gone from 350 to 400. And so you can see that, that concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is the root cause of the global warming, uh, it's something that continues to increase. So if that's the root cause of the problem, it looks like this problem is getting worse. Climate scientists tell us, well, look, when you get to 450 parts per million, that's where there's a greater than equal chance that we're going to start to get some dangerous interference with the climate. So if current trends continue, we get there in about 25 years or less. So we've got a window of opportunity to really try to tackle this problem of about 25 years. And then if you look at where are the sources of CO2 from human activity, you can see the electricity sector here. It's one of the fastest growing sources globally of CO2 emissions. Now CO2 is the majority of greenhouse emissions, but if you add the other ones in, it looks like the power sector accounts for about a third of the problem. And so if we look at the data on economic development, 
and as people get incomes and start to live modern lifestyles, if we look at the one-third increase in GDP per capita in the past 25 years, it's led to a doubling of global electricity consumption. So this is a big problem. The power sector is a major part of it, and it looks like the power sector, if current trends continue, is likely to double again in the next 25 years. So let's make an assessment of where are we with regard to this problem. And so what I've put together here for you is something we call the carbon footprint. So if you look at the y-axis, it's CO2 per dollar of GDP. And if you look at the x-axis, it's GDP per capita. So if you multiply them together, you get CO2 per person, so a carbon footprint. And so that curve there shows you the combinations of those two factors that give you the same carbon footprint, CO2 per person. And so when we look at the things that climate scientists are telling us, the kind of 80% reduction you know, from 1990 levels, to get down to, from where we are today, about 48 gigatons a year to maybe 26 gigatons a year to stabilize things at two degrees, we'd have to get towards that curve. And what I'm showing you is how has the world been doing? And so you can see I've traced out the past the pathway from 1990 to 2012 of the world's carbon footprint. And what you can see is, although there's been progress in reducing CO2 per dollar of GDP, economic developments increased GDP per person, and really, we haven't closed any of this gap between where our carbon footprints are and where they need to be. So despite 25 years of international efforts and lots of, of policies around the world uh, to tackle this, it doesn't look like we're making much progress. Now, there are people that focus on different metrics. You know, the percentage increase in renewables, the percentage decline in the cost of PV panels, the number of countries that have signed the Paris Agreement. But the bottom line here, if the root cause is CO2 emissions in the atmosphere, and we look at the pathway of our carbon footprints, it doesn't look like we're making much progress. So, the final graphic here is let's focus on the power sector. Uh, what are we seeing on the power sector? So if the power sector today is about a third of the problem, and a lot of the solution is going to be things like electric vehicles, electrifying transportation, and so forth, if I give that policy target, if I give 40% of it to the power sector, I trace out the curve that I've shown you here. So in the long run, if we want to deliver on what climate scientists tell us we need to do with the electricity carbon footprint, we'd have to get towards that curve. And what do we see? Um, well, let's start with Germany, for example. Germany is on the leading edge of climate policy in the power sector. We've got one-sixth of the world's solar PVs installed in Germany, problem being it's not a terribly sunny place. And what you've seen is, what Germany has done is, in the year 2000, they had 30% of their power from nuclear. Today it's 15, and by 2022 it'll be zero. So they've essentially replaced nuclear power with wind and solar backed up by coal. So Germany's building new coal-fired power plants to back up and fill in for the, for the solar and the wind intermittency. And what you can see is, although it's a well-publicized climate initiative, Germany's moving away from the frontier that they need to achieve. The world is moving away from the carbon policy frontier. The US is moving towards it, but let me caution you on interpreting this. When you look at the US reduction in electricity use per capita, half of the, you know, one of the factors of our carbon footprint, most of that is the industrial sector. And a third of all electricity consumption in the industrial sector is primary metals and chemicals. Where is that going? That's going to places like China, which is why China's moving to the right as we move to the left. And the movement down in CO2 per kilowatt hour for the US is because the biggest innovation in energy in our lifetime wasn't 
solar PV panels or wind turbines. It was the shale gas revolution that's made natural gas a fossil fuel more abundant and lower cost. And so it's a, a fossil fuel innovation that's led to this decline in CO2 per kilowatt hour in the US. But if we move to a world of 50% renewables backed up by natural gas, we've got a carbon footprint that's about 0.5 CO, pounds of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That would support on that frontier about a third of the electricity we use in our modern lifestyles here in the US. All right, so what's the other big takeaway from this graphic? Who's close to being where they need to be with their electricity carbon footprints? Let's start with India. It's, a, it's largely a coal-fired power system, and it's close to it because of energy poverty. We've got several hundred million people that don't have access to electricity. So energy poverty is no way to get to the frontier. And of course, what stands out there is Ontario and France. So what, what are the characteristics of Ontario? Uh, nuclear power's increased from 53 to 60 percent of the generation mix. Hydro gives you another 24. So you add in 6 percent renewables and some natural gas, and you've got a carbon footprint that looks like where the world would have to be uh, to achieve what climate scientists are telling us we need to do in about the next 25 years. And the other place there is France, which currently is about 75 percent nuclear, but will move to 50 percent nuclear by 2025. So the bottom line here is if we've got any chance of addressing this climate change challenge from a policy perspective, I think we need an example for the rest of the world to follow of an advanced economy electricity sector that's able to support the electricity use of a modern lifestyle that has the kind of carbon footprint that's going to get us where climate scientists tell us we need to go. So with that, I think we've set up maybe the size, scope, timeline of the problem, and the conclusion that to get there, it looks like nuclear power, along with a lot of other initiatives, would have to be part of the solution. So with that, let's move to the panel now, and, um, and we'll start to ask the question, um, you know, their sense of this big picture, the size of the problem, the timeline we've got, and whether they see nuclear as kind of an ex essential part of the solution. Let me start with Christine. Well, obviously, I'm a firm believer in the scope of the problem and how serious it is. It's, it's a national security issue for us, and uh, it's something that we have to get the public's mind around, uh, the importance of it. I have taken, in a lot of instances, to talking more about health and the impact of dirty air, because that's how we get at it, and it relates it more to the people themselves. They, you talk to people about climate change, and they say, what can I do about it? I'm one person, it's this big amorphous thing that scientists don't all agree on, and I've got leaders that are telling me it isn't real and we have nothing to do with it. And we need to reposition that and try to let them see that the health impacts from dirty air, that you know, in 2013, the year for which we have the statistics, you had 91,000 people here in the United States who died from dirty air-related diseases, symptoms, uh, whether it's uh, emphysema, heart attacks, whatever. Um, and that's almost three times as many people have died with car and car accidents on our roads during that year. And yet we spend a lot of time talking about making our roads safer and our cars safer, but not about making our air safer. So I've kind of taken that tact a bit because the national security issue isn't as real. Now you are starting to see we're getting, we are getting stories from Alaska. We're getting stories from along our coast where people are actually being impacted today. This city, Miami, every time it rains heavily, you get water intrusion on the streets, you get flooding. So people are starting to see that this is happening, beginning, I believe, to accept it. And we have to show them a way forward that makes sense. And to me, nuclear has got to be part of that equation. And that's what Case Energy is all about, trying to educate people on nuclear, answering their questions so they can be comfortable and make the, a determination of what energy mix they want, because it's going to have to be all of the above. So, so the bottom line, as you see it, if I could summarize it, you've got health effects that are very immediate to us. You've got longer-term climate effects on sea levels and so forth. So 
in your mind, the benefits of doing something outweigh the costs, but the question is, what are we going to do and what is it going to cost? Well, they, first of all, they far and away do it, but again, cost avoidance is a hard thing to communicate to people when you say it, it is, you can save a lot of money by spending a lot of money now, even though you may not see the results right away, and that's you know, always been the conundrum with uh, any environmental regulation. We were talking to people about spending more money or changing behavior for an issue they might not even see or they might not think is real. But we really have to do it and we need to listen more to those who are saying, look, we've got a real stake in this. So just the Bering Sea, as it opens up, Russia wants to get it, whatever kind of resources are underneath that. Canada wants it. We have one icebreaker, Russia has nine. Um, this is a security issue we're going to have mm -hmm. to talk about, not to mention when we deploy troops when there's a natural disaster from drought or flood or anything else around the world. And this takes our troops away and puts them in other places. So it's a, it's a big issue. It's a complicated issue. What we have to figure out is how do we break it down so that people understand and can see the relevance of nuclear and the role it plays in addressing that issue in a very good way to stimulate the economy when you talk about the, the jobs that come with nuclear and what a difference that can make in a community where these utilities are located. Right. Okay, let me turn to you, Doug. Big picture, size of the problem, the time that we've got, the role of nuke, what's your take? So I just want to start out by saying uh, a couple years ago uh, when we were, we, our organization has been involved in international negotiations for some time we have experience uh, or people that have been involved at every single conference of parties since, since they've been occurring. Um, when we were focused on the Copenhagen goal, which was to reduce U.S. emissions 17% by 2020, and we started to look at what was happening in the U.S. with uh, the premature closure of five reactors and what a big deal uh, the amount of carbon-free uh, electricity was coming from those nuclear reactors. That's what really got it on our radar screen as an organization. We had not come out uh, in support of nuclear power as a, a climate solution, and not every environmental organization has, but we do think that nuclear is definitely part of this uh, uh, solution, th this very challenging solution. And as you pointed out in your introduction, we are continuing to see uh, carbon, global carbon dioxide emissions. They've leveled off a bit in the past couple years, but the trajectory is still that the, the problem is, is an increasing one. Uh, so I do, I do want to play a, a bit of a, a role as an, a, a practical uh, optimist here. In the past couple years, we've, we have seen some very favorable things. We have an administration that's been very supportive of reducing the U.S.'s carbon emissions and being a leader in that area. We had the Clean Power Plan final rule come out. Uh, and then, uh, of course, at the international level last year, we had the, the Paris Agreement, uh, and where virtually every country in the world uh, got on board with this, with this framework. So it's, it, it's after not having a lot of, of victories in the past with regard to climate, it's kind of nice to celebrate a couple of victories at least. And I think the momentum or the thinking is, is, is correct right now. But that, that being said, if you add up all of the pledges that the countries have submitted for the, at least the first round of the Paris Agreement, uh, Climate Action Tracker and some other organizations have come out with analysis and it's not putting us on that two degree uh, pathway that the uh, scientists say that we need, on, need to be on to avoid the worst effects of climate change. Uh, taking it back to the U.S., we see that even the goal that the U.S. has submitted, our nationally determined contribution, uh, we've, we get most of the way there. We're, we, our analysis and analysis of other organizations get us maybe 22, 23 percent of our reducing our emissions 26 to 28 percent by 2025 below the 2005 baseline level. So there, there are some positive things that we've seen happening from this administration as a leader. And you know, we've been able to have some joint announcements with China, uh, which, which is very positive as well, since they're the largest contributor currently to the uh, greenhouse gas issue. But you know, we, we, we 
definitely have a, a very challenging uh, road ahead of us. All right, uh, Jay, your take on the big picture? Well, in, in February this year in Davos, Switzerland, the World Economic Forum out of 29 risk factors to the world ranked climate change number one. And those are 750 global CEOs. Um, and, and we might not agree whether that's one or 29, but still there's a, there's a huge risk here. Um, and no, I don't think we're on the path to, to solve this thing. Um, and I don't think we're gonna solve it without the United States of America. Um, I do think that just about anybody in this room could solve this problem if they were president of the United States and controlled both sides of Congress. And why do I say that? Because I think nuclear, of all the levers that we can pull, and we should pull all of them, is the number one lever that could be pulled. I think it's a matter of policy. We, we're in a political mess, uh, as Jim you know, uh, laid out very well. Um, and that drives policy, which drives our regulatory systems, which disallows us from, from creating new technologies. And our country has always been the one that innovates, whether it's fracking that was adopted by George Mitchell, Mitchell horizontal, horizontal drilling, I should say, whether it was solar panels in the AT&T Bell Labs. I mean, we can do this. Um, we've done it before. We put a man on the moon in nine years with slide rules, and somehow we can't get advanced nuclear through the system with 10 or 15 years and a billion dollars. It's just from a guy who's been looking at this for about five months. I've been following the broader debate for much longer, and I do have people on my team that have been following this for longer, but it just doesn't make sense to me. We can do this if we prioritize it. We can preserve the fleet, and we can build the technologies that the rest of the world needs to build out to solve this problem. Uh, it's primarily, primarily a political problem. Uh, I'm in Congress, I'm in the halls of Congress a lot, uh, and there is incremental work going on. Right now we have a bill with Sheldon Whitehouse and James Inhofe, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act underway, which is kind of bizarre. Um, but there's seeds of hope here. And if we get a president that puts the foot to the gas as this country has done before, I believe that we can do it. Well, when it comes to the, the political side, you, you uh you bring up some interesting uh, observations there. It looks like there's kind of a competing vision uh, for the future. And just this week, New York put out some more details on reforming its energy vision. Their conclusion is that the power sector of the future should be small and decentralized, not large uh, central station power plants like nuclear plants, and that um, People can save money and you can create jobs. It's kind of a win-win proposition to move to a small, decentralized efficiency and renewables world, which is kind of a competing vision to a critical role for nuclear and grid-based power supply. How do you see those two visions kind of competing in the political sector right now? We'll start with you and just walk down the, the panel uh, here. Well, we, we call that sunshine and bunny rabbits. I. I uh... And look, I think Richard Kaufman and the team is doing great work, and I think they're, they're doing great work uh, with the utility space there and creating a, differentiated, a different type of business model and economic incentives, which makes sense. But when you look at the math that we just looked at or you looked at the, you looked at the data, it, we, I just don't think it adds up. You take Diablo Canyon off, offline uh, this year and you lose a whole year of solar development in a state that's about half of the solar development in the United States. I just, I just don't think that, I don't think that makes sense. I, I do think that it makes, that we should do that work. I think we, we should have more solar. I think people should be allowed to put it on the roof. But if we really want to solve the problem, I agree with Bill Gates, we need to have game changing technologies and we certainly need to preserve the fleet that we have. Yeah, so in that regard, uh, Christine, you know, the idea of does it add up or not, but it does add up, it gets a lot of traction in the political space. Yes, that vision, the competing vision there? Of well, kind I don't of think, I, I wouldn't talk about advanced processors or small modular reactors as competition for the bigger reactors. I think they're complementary, and it is the future, and it will give people a, a sense when you talk to them about what's happening in the nuclear field and start to educate them as to what's really going on, how technology is changing, becoming safer, downsizing. Uh, easier to manage, a whole bunch of things, they get a more of a sense of confidence. 
And I, I agree, we need to have do better with solar and wind, and we'll figure out how to start saving that power at some point, but we don't now, and we're a 24-7 society. We've got to have the base underlying power. You cannot just rely on peak shaving, and it's gonna take a long time to get there. If we're looking at a 24% increase in electricity demand by uh, 2040, that, that's yesterday for a utility that has to make the, the investment decisions. But unfortunately, since we, most of them are publicly traded and we work on a quarterly basis and we have a, we demand a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders and you've got to turn a profit. It does, it discourages the short-term investment. So right now, as was pointed out, what we're doing, looking at is uh, the fracking and the access to natural gas is undercutting the appetite for the investment in going forward with the nuclears making those making those dollars count because they're, it's the cheaper form of energy available now, although we've been here before where it was low natural gas and the prices went up. It's a finite resource and it's dirty. You're much dirtier than the nuclear and uh, we need people to understand that. Um, Doug, it, within the environmental community, do you see a tension here with these competing visions? One that nuclear plays a big part in being a solution, the other one where it doesn't? You see, I think, in the environmental community a, l a lot of push for wind and solar and that, that they can do it all. Uh, and the same would be true of distributed generation. There's, if you read most of the uh, material, the, the press that's put out about those technologies, I, I would say it's, it's certainly very, it's not focused on nuclear as, as a solution. Um, I, I think if anybody uh, as we have and, and some other environmental groups have studied the, uh, the benefits of centralized power generation. You know, it's, it, the tales of its death are you know, greatly exaggerated. The, there, there's a lot of efficiencies that you get, obviously, by having a, a centrally uh, gener generating power station. Uh, and you know, the, the distributed uh, systems got a lot of press around for their resiliency, which is another big area in uh, environmental circles, you know, especially with regard to Superstorm Sandy, how you know, certain people that had microgrids and uh, distributed systems set up were, were able to survive a, and outlast some of the other systems uh, during that uh, very large storm. So I, I, I see a bit of an education process it, it, and a, a, a very powerful ongoing debate about whether you know, wind and, sol wind and solar can do it all. I, I think that they certainly run up uh, with some difficulties at large scale uh, penetration at this, at this point in time with, with local substations and if there's too much of it con concentrated in a particular region and you don't get the geographically dispersed resources. But um, yeah, I think we really need to think about uh, preserving the, nu the nuclear resources. Uh, it's interesting, you, you mentioned education. That's come up a couple of times here that it's important to try to educate people um, with regard to some of this basic CO2 arithmetic and the potential for technologies uh, like wind and solar, uh, their limits because of intermittency and, and so forth. But so much of public perceptions seem to be driven by emotion. Um, and, you know, when, <clears throat> when nuclear plants have closed down, and we look at San Onofre or Vermont Yankee or Pilgrim, we see an environmental community that actually celebrates these closures. Uh, how do we, edu you know, educate in an environment where this is largely emotion, not really data and, and logic? It, is that a problem? You know, the, in trying to get people's opinions to turn around, Christine? Well, that's what CASE is all about. I mean, what we do at the Clean Safe Energy Coalition, we've been doing it now for 10 years, we're over 4,000 members, is to get into those communities where there is, we don't lobby for a particular nuclear reactor or relicensing or, or a new one to come online, but what we'll do where there is some appetite for that is try to get in there and answer people's questions because they have no idea. Today's the millenniums, if they know anything about nuclear, it's from the Simpsons, because one of them works at a nuclear plant and glows at night. And that's not the best way to get your information. And so what we do is we'll go in, we'll do op-eds, we'll do uh, call-in shows, 
uh, I'll speak to my co-chair and I will go and, and Ron Kirk will go and speak at uh, Chambers of Commerce and try to not just to speak to the people who understand it already, but get to those people that really don't. And they've got legitimate questions and they should be answered, but the nuclear industry has really good responses for the majority of them, for all of them, I think. And it's fair to, to answer those questions. Let them ask them, let them answer them. We now have a, a new site, the uh, Clean Power Resource Center, that allows the policymakers of any state to go into that and see how they could possibly reach the clean power plan goals in their state with or without nuclear. What it would mean to bring on another nuclear reactor, what it would mean if you lost a nuclear reactor, what your challenges would be. So they have to have that information in order to be able to make an informed decision by definition. If you're making an informed decision, you have information. And they need the support of their constituents. And that's what you have to try to do. And we've seen we've been effective. When we can get into those places before the shouting starts, which is what's key, and let people ask questions and, and answer them and send them to the website to take a look at it, um, the support for nuclear goes up. People become more comfortable. They just don't know the facts today. Yeah. Uh, Jay, your sense of perceptions, are we making progress uh, or not uh, on this education or perception idea? Right, so we're focused on Congress um, where and in Congress, we're focused on the right side of the aisle uh, in Congress because traditionally the right side of the aisle has not had a voice about a, a clean baseload energy program. And in that, in that space, there is a lot of agreement. Oh, virtually no Republican congressman is against, uh, is against nuclear. And there's a lot of individual little sporadic things going on today. And I think we should, we should be highly supportive of that. We should all be focused on that. I know Alex is working hard on that as we are. Um, so th there's room there. And they can get away with doing stuff because this is, a lot of this is gonna be through appropriations or budgeting and things where they're not gonna, they're not gonna take hits in the district. As far as the grassroots movement, I would say something that um, I think Sierra's struggling with. Let's get Michael Bruhn out there to say that nuclear has to be part of the solution. If that actually happened, I, you know, let, let's, go, let's go to the thought leaders in that space and show them Michael Schellenbacher's slideshow that I read on the plane ride down this morning. It's, it's just, it's incredibly hard to argue. So I would go to the head of the organization and say, if we're gonna be responsible about climate change, daggone it, let's stop, let's stop trying to ride the fence on, uh, on nuclear and let's, let's go all in. They're not there yet. I've, one of my co-chair originally was Dr. Patrick Moore, who was one of the co-founders of Greenpeace because he said, look guys, we were against nuclear weapons, not nuclear power. They took him off the website immediately. He does not exist as far as, uh, <laughs> as, far as they're concerned. Right, and, and that kind of problem with the kind of mainstream thought leaders in the environmental community. Uh, Doug, what, what trends do you see there? Do you expect greater support as we're looking in the years to come, or do you see this as a chronic uh, kind of problem? Frankly, I, I'm very surprised that more environmental organizations are not supportive. There are, you know, really just a handful of us that that are supportive, and you know, a lot of it probably goes back to their, their grassroots organizations. And you know, we we don't our organization is not a grassroots organization per se, but it's it is surprising to me. It, it feels very much like a no-brainer. That, nu that nuclear energy is a carbon-free energy, that it should be treated like all of the other uh, s sources of carbon or zero emission energy that we've, this country has been supporting in various, at the federal level and at the state level for some time. Uh, it's, it is very surprising how uh, when a clean energy, a federal clean energy standard was proposed a few years back, how it gained absolutely no traction. Uh, I, I don't um, understand where the, where the gap is exactly. I, I do think education is, is really important and uh, perhaps it's, it, it would be a good idea going forward for me and, and other people in the environmental community to, to try to build consensus in the environmental community around this I, rather than just talking to my friends at, at Third Way and EDF and, and other organizations that are supportive of nuclear power. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, you know, so I, I got into this game after being a business guy for a long time and I was in rooms 
talking about a lot of these problems, and I saw more talk than I did action. Here, here's an idea. Why don't we all write a letter to Michael Brune today from the nuclear industry uh, and say, please, please, I, I think they're debating this issue right now. Please come out in favor of nuclear. It's, it's a responsible thing for climate. You know, on one hand, we sort of give Republicans a hard time because we're not willing to come out on climate change, right, because of our donor base, frankly. And in this case, I think maybe the environmental movement's afraid to come out because of their donor base. So maybe we should highlight that and start pushing. I think we have to push. We have to have a loud voice. Uh, if you're not at the table, this is what I say in D.C. all the time, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's push. We don't have a ton of time. And there's these companies out there right now that are trying to get through pro licensing, and they're in other countries trying to do these things. Um, we need a better government. We need better policy. In order to do that, we, it would be an easy solve to get a couple of big environmental groups to tilt the tide here to make it easier. It's interesting, as, as you say that, it makes me think of what Jim uh, Vandehei just said about a lot of issues. We have polarization, and that there's very little in the middle there to try to create some compromise, negotiation. Um, Christine, you've got a lot of experience in the political world, right, uh, with regard to, to this. When you look at the nuclear issue and the kind of compelling, this linear data-driven story that it would have to be part, along with renewables and efficiency, to get where you need to go. Do you see any strong force kind of pushing sides together to get there? Not as much as I'd like to see, but to me it's a natural, it's a natural place where you actually could get consensus, because what you've got for the Democrat side is you've got the clean air aspect of it. You've got the climate change aspect of it. And the environmental groups are a strong part of their base, so it, it appeals to them. And, and most of the groups, even though they're never, some of them will never embrace nuclear, they're not going to fight it. At least I don't see them fighting it in the way they have in the past, because they care too much about climate change and clean air. And for the Republicans, if you talk about an economic driver, nuclear reactors, investment in new technology, the jobs that come along with that are enormous and really well paying. So it's a place where there is a, a nat there should be a natural ability to do it, and it's going to be people like Jay that's going to get it done because we've got to have that kind of discussion. And, you know, you've got various groups on, in Washington that are no labels and, and others that are trying to bring together people around issues, and we need to get them to take up energy as an issue. I would love it if the Congress would pass an energy plan for change. We don't have one in this country, but it, it would just say clean, green, reliable, affordable, and leave it at that. Uh, let the marketplace figure out which is the best way to address it, but that's what we want. And both sides should be able to come together, particularly around nuclear, as a response to that. Well, you mentioned a kind of desirable aspects of a federal approach. I'd be interested in the panel's assessment. When you look at the Clean Power Plan as proposed, uh, do you think it's technology neutral, or do you think it involves some benign neglect of nuclear? I'd be interested. We'll start with you, Doug. I tend to think that it's, it's technology neutral. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a very flexible uh, approach, and I think they really listen to a lot of the uh, comment, commentators, which is why it's such an incredibly long rule, because it goes into exhaustive detail of, about each of the comments that every interest group made. Um, I mean, it, it, nuclear does require uh, uh, solutions and it's not explicitly called out within it, but there are certainly frameworks within the mass-based approach or the rate-based approach whereby nuclear could benefit if uh, a, a state could, you know, or virtually organize within itself uh, a carbon price, which would we think at C2ES is the best way to help benefit nuclear power. Um, within, and it was mentioned uh, earlier by, by other speakers, how what an incredible percentage the 2012 baseline is of nuclear power within states. So there's sort of this um, um, implicit incentive to, to keep a nuclear power reactor 
going within your state because it would be very expensive to try to replace it if, if you had a mass-based system and, uh, and you were thinking about just going with a natural gas fire generator to replace it. That's a lot of uh, many millions of metric tons of CO2 that would be replacing the zero emission source. So I think you know, it, it's, it's going to require some effort uh, to work with the, the, the state, the people that are writing the plans in the states to help nuclear. But the opportunity is certainly there. Christine? Well, they certainly changed the rule uh, a great deal between the initial proposed rule and the final rule as it went out uh, to give nuclear some more credibility and to allow those states that had already started, uh, South Carolina and Georgia, to build nuclear reactors to count them toward their new goals, which is important. You can argue they're not giving nuclear enough credit for being such a stable so and big source of clean power. We could do better, but I will say that I think the agency, you can argue over whether they use the right rule, whether they put it in the right place, and some of the particulars, but they were as flexible as they can be under the enabling legislation, because that's something that uh, so many people don't realize how prescriptive Congress made that in telling them what they could consider under the Clean Air Act, when they had to consider it, and how they had to consider it. And one of the things that we found is any time, the way I knew we were in the right place is if I was being sued by both the right and the left, because then you were right in the right place. But um, no matter what rule you came out with, you ended up in court. And it was something that would often, if you tried to provide any kind of flexibility or sensibleness, put some sensibleness behind it, you got hauled into court, and mostly by the environmentalists, and, and we'd lose, because the enabling legislation is pretty strict and pretty clear as to what and how the agency goes forward. So did they do enough for nuclear? You could argue, certainly, I think, no. They could have done a better job of, of making it a more equal playing field, but in fact, they, they moved a long way by taking into consideration the comments during that comment period and made it better, and it's certainly possible now for the states to be encouraged as they decide where they're going to go, how they're going to go, um, to understand that nuclear can play an important part. And again, that's what that resource center that uh, is on our website can do for a state and help them understand how nuclear could move them toward their goal and do it in a much more, in much easier fashion than, than any other type of approach they might take. Right. As melded in with all the others. I mean, you do have to have, we haven't talked about conserving energy at all, and that's going to be a part of it as well right. as the uh, renewables. Right. And Jay, your take on clean power plan and nuclear? Um, I'm going to pivot on to renewable portfolio standards, which I think is more actionable at the state level. And I think everybody here can lobby on renewable portfolio standards and having nuclear included in that standard. And I think it's just wrong in many cases, like in North Carolina, it's not included. Um, so you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. If we, if we take North Carolina as, a, as an instructional case, you know, we were dominated by Democrats for a long time. And then through the last couple of cycles, we've, we're now dominated by Republicans. I think we're going to lose the, the governor. Um, but so you have a renewable portfolio standard under a, Demo a Democratic controlled house and, and governor's mansion, and now the opposite. And uh, so I think in a lot of places in the states, you, you have an unfair playing field. Uh, and I think, I think that could be fixed. I think, that's, I think that's fixable. They're trying to fix that in North Carolina right now. Yeah, when you talk about unintended consequences, one thing that strikes me about the renewable portfolio standards is that these mandates have added a lot of wind and solar, and the unintended consequence was that where you have CO2 allowance markets, there's been a tremendous depression of that price. So that, you know, we're looking at, you know, costs of CO2 in these markets that are, you know, a few dollars per ton when the implicit cost of CO2 reduction with a solar mandate's, you know, 50 or $100 a ton. Do you see that distortion as being a problem? Yes. <laughs> Christine? I agree. I think it is a problem. I mean, that's something that it's, it's complicated, and it's, the states are going to need help, really, in figuring this out, uh, as with the, the federal government, to, to understand just how complex it is and how difficult it is. But uh, it is definitely a problem. The cost is what drives so much of the decision making in this country. Right. People appreciate the efficiency of a good price signal 
right. but the depression, there's a problem. Doug, is that something that the environmental community in general recognizes or not? Um, I, I think the environmental community loves <laughs> the, the, the subsidies the in mandates, general. Yeah. But I, I think that you know it's a balancing act, right? I mean, we want to um, promote technologies to a, to a certain extent, to basic research. I think we all we all benefit. Um, but you know, when it, it comes at the detriment of a, a, a much larger source of zero emission power, then it starts to look a little bit ridiculous that we're you know subsidizing one technology and act like in what's what happened in New England with losing uh, Vermont Yankee. Uh, they had years and years of uh, declines in uh, thanks to the the Reggie system that they have working there in, in CO2 emissions. And then you have one nuclear power plant closed down and emissions go up six or seven percent in in one year. And you know, if that's the result of um, subsidies or then then it's it's misguided. Doug, you bring up New England, mm -hmm. so just for the audience to get grounded here. So you had Vermont Yankee closed down. And so we saw the first full year of the power system without it, and you're right. The ISO New England said last year CO2 emissions in the power sector went up 5%. And of course, we also got the uh, announcement that Pilgrim is going to close down. So within the next couple of years, an even larger nuclear plant in New England is going to close down. And to give people a, a sense of the arithmetic, Pilgrim alone provides 5% of New England's generation all of the wind and solar in New England right now produces 2% of generation. And so you're right, about a decade's worth of decline in CO2 per kilowatt hour in New England is currently being reversed uh, by 2020. Um, so the kind of result, and you know, Vermont's a great example. Under the Clean Power Plan, Vermont doesn't have to do anything. So it closes down its nuclear plant. Environmentalists up there have celebrated it, and the CO2 for their electricity is going up. How do you make sense of this? <laughs> we'll start with Doug and work back. <laughs> it, obviously, it doesn't make sense. You know, I, we, I, I was at the, the nuclear summit last week on the Hill, and there was a, a representative from the town uh, where Vermont Yankee was, and uh, just you know talked about what that nuclear power plant meant to that community. So, um, you know, there's, there's a vocal opposition uh, uh, other than the environmental community that, that realizes the importance of these, these nuclear power plants. And, you know, it's, 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 it's short-sighted. You know, um, Christine was talking about, you know, about companies looking at the next quarter's balance sheet when we, we need to be looking at 2050 emissions in the United States. And it's, it's, we need to uh, educate people, use, use the educate word again, on, on seeing the long-term view of what, that we have to reduce emissions globally 40 to 70 percent by 2050 and take that down to nearly zero uh, effectively by 2100 if we want to uh, solve this carbon dioxide greenhouse gas problem. Christine, New England, and you can see that elsewhere, like New San York could follow. San Onofre. I mean, and you San look at, at how the much there yep. went up, and there's California that's patting itself on the back as being this environmental leader, and yet the statistics for the increase in carbon from the closure of that nuclear reactor is even greater. I think a lot of it, again, it comes back to a lack of understanding that people didn't have the clear picture of what the trade-offs were when they go forward with this. And there was also, because the population didn't have that information, there wasn't any pressure on the policymakers. They didn't feel they had their backs covered. You know, the, the ones who were the loudest were the anti-nukes. They were the loudest. And everybody else who might have understood it uh, said, well, it's common sense. This won't happen because it's so clear that it doesn't make any sense to close them down. And the rest of the population just didn't know and didn't get engaged and said, OK, somebody who knows more than I will, will figure this one out. And for the policymakers, we've seen it again and again. If those who understand and who care don't get engaged, a little bit like what you were saying on the, the Hill, if you don't start pressing people or with the environmental groups and saying, look, you've got to speak out here. You've got to say something, or you've got to say to your policymaker, the one who's making the decisions, you're not crazy if you take this one on. 
and we'll be there for you because most of these people are, or many of them are in elected positions and they listen to their constituents, but they only hear from one side and that's really the problem. And it's true in so many of the issues that we face today in this country that uh, a small group of very motivated people can have an outside of, outsized effect because the rest aren't engaging in the way they need to and they may have great arguments with their car radio or their television set or their spouse, but they're not the ones who are making these decisions. And so they need to get the information and then they need to get engaged. Jay, your lessons from New England? Start at, sort of start at the top a little bit. I think complexity is the biggest problem we face as a nation today. We just heard about sort of this political system that we're in and we're buzzfeeding and tweeting, and, but we're not handling complexity. And, and this issue that we're dealing with, energy systems, environment, or climate change, incredibly complex. So I think we need to show a little bit of grace to the energy system guys and the environmental guys because of the complexity. I don't think that the, inter the environmental guys have taken the time, at least the ones I know, to really understand the energy system world. And they haven't taken the time to understand depreciated assets and cash flows and dispatch orders and, and things that make the world actually turn. They think that we can identify the problem and somehow we can solar panel our way through this. And so again, back to the advocacy piece, I think one reason solar is so strong it's because every solar installer is an advocate. And I would entreat you that perhaps every nuclear industry person should be an advocate as well because um, like also I'll put another guy on the list you could write a letter to and that'd be Mark Jacobson in Stanford. The left has put so much, they've hung so much on this one report that says we can get through uh, this energy crisis with wind, solar, storage and efficiency, 100%. Right? Uh, That's like, that alternative vision we were talking about, yeah. Computer right, industry. which people I know that lived in the energy industry laugh at that, and yet the environmental movement sort of hangs that their hope on that. And so we need to get the conversation pushed out in a way, uh, and again, back to the slideshow I saw, uh, saw this morning, uh, it was just so clear. There needs to be a bigger voice around making nuclear uh, a reality that has to be part of the solution to the environmental groups. So when you think about what would make sense, it, it would be efficiency, renewables, nuclear and gas, the kind of mixes we can see in places like Ontario that, that have got the, um, the carbon footprint where you need to have it. Let me just turn quickly, uh, natural gas has come up a couple of times here, it's putting a lot of competitive pressure on uh, nuclear plant operations and so forth. There's a couple of questions on gas. Um, a lot of people think nuclear has a competitive problem uh, with gas, but that would be true if we had evidence that gas-fired generators are winning in the marketplace. But as you look at their financials, the key merchant generators have all gone bankrupt at least once in the past decade. Natural gas-fired power plants, we've had billions of dollars of write-downs. I think that there's a perception problem here that power markets are working well and the prices are a real economic test, and I'm not sure that's true. An observation on that, yes or no? Your sense? Um, my sense is that, that you know, low natural gas prices and uh, regardless of, of the, if the companies are taking, taking write downs are, are harming all of the, um, the, the sources that, that bid in at, at low or, or zero prices like nuclear and wind and solar, the price takers in the market. Um, but I mean, that's how it was designed to work, and it's it's to the benefit of of consumers more than um, having a, an environmental goal, for example, which is what we're talking about here. So it, the mar that market was not designed to solve this this climate problem. If if it were optimized around zero emission generation or reliable generation or other characteristics, then uh, we would. Be ha this group would certainly be more happy with that outcome than uh, 
delivering low, low, low prices to consumers are, are great things. And I, I, I smile when I open my uh, electric and gas bill because it just seems to be getting cheaper every month. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's not solving this problem. Yeah, well, I'm thinking, for example, Christine, uh, New Jersey's part of PJM, and mm -hmm. PJM's had an energy market, and then they added a capacity market because it didn't look like the energy revenues were high enough, and then the polar vortex hit, and PJM realized, well, they hadn't really even defined what they meant by energy. So these market rules continue to evolve, but my sense is that we still have some problems there that the market prices aren't really where they need to be. Do you see that as a, a problem contributing to this nuclear uh, runoff that we're seeing in the higher CO2 emissions as a result? Well, there's no question that uh, all the regulators and every, everyone is looking now at how do we take advantage of the lowest cost of energy to provide to the consumers, to the ratepayers. And right now, the natural gas phenomena, as it were, um, is driving a lot of that. And that is causing a dislocation in the long-term investment strategies of a lot of the, those in the industry because they kind of have to take advantage of this, and it is a good thing. I mean, people are, are happy when they see their, their power bills go down. Uh, and the problem with that is, as I said before, we've been there before. And it gets very dangerous when you see everyone's all, everybody's eggs being put in one basket when you see this is, okay, this is where we're gonna go and this is what we're going to do and, and we don't have to worry about the rest of it because the solar and the wind, that's the other side and they leave nuclear out of the equation because they say it's just so expensive. Right. And until uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission really streamlines its, its uh, review process and starts to move some of these uh, things through, it's going to stay expensive and perceived as expensive, and, and people will go with the natural gas. Well, Christine, you bring up an important point there about not having all your eggs in one basket. And uh, when we look at natural gas, there's some interesting things happening there. FERC commissioners right now have protesters that are showing up at their houses uh, protesting gas pipeline approvals. We've seen increasing seismic activity associated with fracking that's getting a lot of people alarmed. Aliso Canyon in California, huge leak that's contributed to uh, California's greenhouse gas emissions. The EPA is very focused on the uh, leakage of methane from the whole system. Do you see a, a danger here that we're going to lose a, a good portion of our nuclear supply here and then gas is going to run into some problems politically and, and physically? I think we have to be very careful of that because I do believe you're going to see a uh, slowdown in this appetite for fracking and for natural gas. I'm on something called the Center for Sustainable Shale Development, and the Marcellus Shale is where we're focused, and it's developing standards that go beyond anything currently required in, in law or regulation uh, on how to do fracking and how to have an enclosed system and no, no flaring and those kinds of things. But, the problem you run into is that the big guys get it, and they're willing to go through the process, which takes some six months on any one of the standards to be certified. Um, they understand it, it's the mom and pops, and in the energy field you get so many of those. But I believe we will run into, there are places where fracking is entirely safe and could be done, there are places where it shouldn't be done. Uh, when you stand the potential of damaging the water supply for thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, you made it think twice about whether that's where you want to go, where you want to frack, and you know, you are seeing seismic activity. So I think there's going to be that, that side, of the downside is going to start to be elevated in people's minds, but if we don't continue to make the investment in the nuclear, we are going to be left hanging, because the renewables cannot step up and meet the need in the time frame that we've got it, and we don't want to go back to coal, in spite of Donald Trump. Right. Uh, Jay, I think you'd mentioned complexity, trade-offs, fuel diversity is really complicated. Um, so, you know, your sense here of, um, of whether we're going to appreciate these things on the nuclear side or not? Well, in Congress today, when you score a bill, uh, you, there's no differentiation between investment and expense. Uh, that is a huge problem. Uh, there are two wildly different things. These are some of the crazy learnings I'm having, and uh, we have to fix that, because nuclear is an investment. Nuclear is an investment in a stable, you know, you know the talking points, I don't need to go through them. 
gas is, is, is volatile, and, and nuclear proliferation and our supply chain worldwide, these are all investments that we need to make. And somehow we've got to break through the complexity and have people, under, policymakers understand that uh, there's, an, there's expense and there's investment. And uh, low cost expense uh, is not always the winner when America was built on innovation and investment. And, and so I think that's, that's where we're focused uh, trying to make those arguments. You got a question? Oh, yep. we have a lot of questions. A lot of questions. We have a lot of questions, and I, I want to satisfy the room a little bit, so, so let me start with a few. Uh, Matthews asked, with good reason, we look at the ability of the U.S. to meet the Paris goals of 26 to 28 percent by 2030, but if much of that reduction comes from shifting coal to gas, how will we meet the more ambitious targets to stay below two degrees? Well, the point I tried to uh, make with the, the graphics is I think there's a high probability that the U.S. is not going to deliver on its 2025 commitment if you just look at trends in arithmetic right now on CO2 in the U.S. 44% of the U.S. pledge was the EPA's estimate of what was going to happen in the power sector, and that didn't include the nuclear closures we've seen or the delay from the courts. Uh, you get to three quarters of the U.S. pledge when you add in transportation to the power sector. And on transportation, we've already seen low gasoline prices have increased, vehicle miles traveled, and we're selling now more trucks and big SUVs than small cars. So I think it's more likely than not the U.S. is going to miss its pledge, and it won't be long before these stock take meetings are starting to put some social pressure on the U.S. to shame us into doing more. Um, I, again, I think it's innovation and technology that's going to get us out of this mess. Either it will or we won't. It won't. Uh, in this case, uh, there's a new technology called an alum cycle carbon sequestra sequestration technology that's uh, actually under development in Texas right now. And uh, it, uses, it uses carbon dioxide instead of steam to turn the turbine captures 100% of the carbon and with no, ex, no extra cost, at least on paper, relative to a combined cycle uh, turbine. So natural gas, be it on the hill and watching the, the, the lobby, the, uh, the weight of that industry, I think it's here to stay. We've got to learn how to deal with it in a, from a technology standpoint, and there's some promising things out there. But again, we've got to focus on it, and we've got to understand the difference between investment and expense. Anybody on the Paris Agreement, whether we get um, there or not? Sure. Uh, oh, I, I think that um, e forecasting is, is, is always a challenging thing. I, I, in, in 2005, the uh, EIA forecast that our emissions were going to be 16% above what they, um, or, or that they would increase by 16% and they actually declined by, by 10%, and nobody at that time would have foreseen this, this big shale revolution in, in 2005 when we had climbing natural gas prices. Um, there's, there's plenty of market share that, that natural gas can still take away from coal. I think coal is still a fairly sizable share of the electricity market in 2025 when the um, target is, is set for. Um, maybe we, we can see some some advances in small modular reactors or uh, around, around that time, time frame. It's probably a little um, beyond that, that time frame, but there, I, I do believe technology and maybe energy efficiency, some of, the, some of these things can, can help to get us to the goal. And the right. other piece have, of good news is so many of the uh, corporations today are taking action without having, to, without having any law or anything pushing them, and, because they're getting pushed by their shareholders, saying, right. what is your environmental profile? What is your environmental footprint? And so they are reducing their carbon footprint all down the supply chain as well as their water use. Yeah, there was huge support. Uh, many companies were in Paris, and then they, they signed an agreement or a, 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 an agreement of support with the, with the White House in the lead up to the, the uh, Paris summit in, back in December. Let me ask a last question of the panel. A lot of questions about how to educate uh, millennials. Let me sum it up with one from Travis. It seems paradigm change is largely produced through either generational education or crisis. 
Which do you feel will ultimately determine the final path forward on this, pro on this problem? Start with Doug, we'll move down. <laughs> right. Wow, can we come to me last? Um, yeah, I, it's hard in talking with lots of different, different kinds of people. To, I'm always surprised by who supports new, uh, to me it's, it's, it's like a regional issue, it's an age issue. Uh, I think we, I think we just need to, to um, talk, have, have the conversation with, with people, with our, with our friends, our families, our, our, the, the younger generation and, and educate them and uh, give them, the, give them the information that they need to, to make what we hope is the, the right decision. I would hope it's education. That's why we do what we do at CASE. Um, unfortunately, nobody reacts better to a crisis in this country. And it also really propels behavior. But I hope we don't have to go there. But I hope it's not a crisis and we can do it through education, but we've got to keep pushing it. I think the answer is government in this case. I think it's a policy, it's policy advocacy that'll get us there with, a, with enough grassroots to to stop the attacks, and I think everybody can play a part in that. Yeah, I would just uh, add that, you know, I think with education, I think we have to realize um, a lot of perceptions about climate change are driven by emotions, not data. So I think people are afraid of climate change. I think people feel guilty that they lead lifestyles that involve CO2 emissions. And so I think that's why solar PV is so popular, because it's visible. It makes people feel good that we're doing something about climate change. And if we just approach this with data that's complicated and trade-offs, I think we talk past each other. So I think for millennials, we've got to bridge that gap between emotional perceptions and the reality. Join me in, in thanking the panel for a very thought-provoking discussion. I want to th thank all of you for your attention this morning and your participation. Uh, sorry we couldn't take more questions. Uh, we now are going to adjourn until 1.30. Uh, the top innovative practice awards luncheon is in the Ivanka 